today's Monday again, so it must be time for Mozart Mondays. Last week we looked at the first movement of Mozart Symphony No. 40 in G minor, and we're going to carry on with that today with the second movement, the slow movement. Now, you might remember that the first movement ended very, very dramatically in its home key of G minor. It sounded a little bit like this. There's no doubting what key we're in there. But as soon as the second movement opens, we know we're in a completely different world. We've moved now into the wonderfully warm key of E flat major. It's almost like sinking into a warm bath. It's a completely different mood and the atmosphere is transformed. Most of the melodic material for this movement is contained in the opening eight bars, and I'm going to play the opening theme now. It actually starts in the violas, then moves to the second violins, and then moves to the first violins, who complete the theme, and I'll play them one after the other. So the first thing you hear are these repeated notes that move up the sections. It's an incredibly simple idea, repeating a note for a bar, but it actually becomes one of the most important building blocks of this movement, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. But if we take away the repeated notes, I'm just going to play you the intervals, the main structure of this first theme. It starts with a rising fall. So straight away after these falling, yearning semitones of the first movements, something is rising. And a fifth. And a sixth. And then this resolves. So these intervals gradually expand as each section come in. It's almost like this movement is rising from the ashes of the first movement. And in fact, we can take this one stage further. If I remove those bass notes and just play the melody that appears over the top, it goes like this. And those of you who know your Mozart symphonies are instantly going to recognise this as a hugely slowed down version of the opening of the last movement of the Jupiter Symphony, number 41, the next symphony he wrote. If I play it faster and carry on, you'll recognise it. Etc, etc. It's in the wrong key, but it's very obviously the same notes as the Jupiter Symphony. And this is something when I first realised this, I was absolutely staggered by it. I'd never seen this written down or discussed as a kind of thing. Um, but for me, it's a very, very clear relationship. Now, I don't know if Mozart meant it. I don't know if when he was writing his Jupiter, he wanted to hark back to this movement of the previous symphony. But subconscious or not, I think the link there is very, very clear. One of the other most important musical ideas in this movement you heard towards the end of that main theme. It's a little bird-like chirrup, a kind of scotch snap. That's its first appearance, but it very quickly becomes very important. It pops up all over the place. In the second main theme, it, it forms a kind of end of phrase, like this. In fact, it continues through this theme to become the most important musical feature. And I'll play you that now. It's divided between the first violins and the flute. They kind of answer each other until the first violins develop it right to the end of the phrase. So what I'm going to try and do is read the score and play the first violin and the flute part. This is going to test my score reading abilities a little bit, but let's give it a go. unusual little figure this. I'm trying to think of another piece of Mozart that uses this little scotch snap rhythm quite so much, and actually I can't, and it becomes a very, very important distinguishing feature of this movement.
So this bird chirp is the second most important thematic idea in the movement, and you may remember the first with the repeated quavers we heard at the beginning. And when it comes to the development section, he very simply uses these two ideas on top of each other. If I put the violin down for a second, I can show you the score, and you'll see what I mean. It almost looks like a kind of 18th century version of cut and paste, um, a horrific thing to accuse Mozart of, but I'm sure you can see what I mean. Here we have the repeated quavers from the first bar. Here we have the bird chirps. And you can see how he's constructed this dramatic piece of music by just laying one on top of the other and reversing that, and on it goes. As I say, it's an incredibly simple compositional technique, but incredibly powerful, and it's a very dramatic section of the, of the movement. Now, the idea of this bird chirp um, actually relates to something we heard in the first movement. Um, it's a sort of speeded up version of this appoggiatura that's so important in the opening theme, these falling semitones. If I play you one more time the end of that second subject, and you remember it was these falling bird chirps that went like this. If I slow those down, you can hear they are the same appoggiaturas that we heard in the first movement. Now I don't know if this is a sub conscious or a conscious relationship, but you often find this in Mozart, that you have similar ideas throughout all four movements that kind of bind the symphony together. And for a listener, it does create relationships between the movements, whether we recognise them or not. These kind of subliminal relationships that give a unity to what we're listening to. And there are other examples of that in this movement. In the second bar of the movement, there's a chromatic scale in the cellos. These kind of, almost the yearning semitones that we heard in the first movement. You may remember the second main theme of the first movement. And it continues with this. So the semitones, the chromatic scale, is reintroduced right at the beginning of this slow movement, almost as if it wants to undermine the peace and tranquility of those opening repeated quavers. Another thing that harks back to the first movement is the way it opens. You may remember the first movement opened with the violas, playing these kind of brushed G minor chords. And that sonority is remembered here at the beginning of the slow, slow movement, because again he opens with the violas in a very similar register. So what he's doing here, again subconsciously or not, is unifying these movements by creating a similar mood, a similar atmosphere with the sonority with the mellowness and the warmth of that viola sound. So these are just a few ideas of things to listen out for in this movement. This performance was the same that we had last week from St John Smith Square about 18 months ago. Hopefully you'll stay well this week and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care.